Awesome. Welcome, everyone. I'm Bree Maniscalco, the Executive Director of Cinema St. Louis, uh, presenters of the St. Louis Filmmakers Showcase, and this masterclass is part of the showcase this year. So thank you so much for joining us, and a huge thanks to our friends here at Cape Sokol for providing this masterclass. They did one earlier during SLIF last November. It was a huge success, and we're excited that they're bringing it back for our local filmmakers. Um, and then we'll continue to do some master classes going forward. Um, so just a little bit of housekeeping items. The restrooms are out that way. Um, we'll do a happy hour gathering after. If you parked in the garage, we do have parking validations for you for after. So see either Pete or myself. Um, and then also uh, this session is being recorded. So if you want to refer back to it later, you can. We will send a link out to you and it will live on Cinema St. Louis's YouTube channel. Um, so look for that. And then we can also send you the PowerPoint presentation as well. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and introduce our panel today. Pete from Cape Sokol, the screen lawyer, as he's called. And then Kara Lambert, thank you so much to both of them uh, and to Cape Sokol. Uh, so the St. Louis Filmmakers Showcase, this is our 22nd year. Um, in total, we have presented 1,800 films since the inception of the showcase. Um, it's a chance for local filmmakers to share their talent and for St. Louis to learn what local filmmaking could look like and why they should advocate for tax credits in Missouri for filmmaking. Um, so we're always looking for people to help us with those efforts as well. And if you haven't checked out the showcase, please come by. This is the final weekend, tomorrow night through Sunday. Um, we have a great lineup this closing weekend, and then the closing night party is free, also sponsored by Cape Sokol. Um, on Sunday night at Blueberry Hill at 7 p.m., we're going to have a DJ, a belly dancer, free drinks, compliments of Urban Chestnut. It's, it's free to attend. We do shake you down for donations at the door, though, just a heads up, bring some cash. Um, and it's, it's going to be a fun event. We give out little trophies, and we announce which films go on to Sliff in November. And we also will uh, award the best film of Showcase, the Essie Award, which is a $500 cash prize. So enough for me, on to the main show. Thank you. Thanks, Bree. Welcome, everybody. Good to be back here, Kara. Yeah, glad to be back. Glad to have more people in yeah. person, finally in the space. Yeah, we did this uh, last November, and it was virtual. There were one or two people there. It was a little bit more echoey, but we're glad you're here. <laughs> Um, we're going to take you through, uh, in this session, sort of an overview, um, not super high level, but, you know, section by section of some key aspects of how the law impacts film, and particularly for you all as filmmakers, from the ground up, from the rights acquisition stage all the way through distribution and everything else. So, um, there's some time for questions at the end, but... We got a small group here in a collegial room. We're creative people. You all are creative people. If you have a question or something, feel free to ask. If we can get into a dialogue, that's perfectly fine. If I'm going to get to it later, I'm going to say, hey, we'll come back to that. But please feel free to join in the conversation. Um, as as Bree said, uh, Kara and I are the enter part of the entertainment uh, practice here in uh, at Cape Sokol. We represent production companies, filmmakers. We've done many, many, many television shows, reality TV, documentary films, feature films. Uh, now it's YouTube channels and social media influencers. Basically, if something ends up on a screen, we have done everything from the deal structure to the business structure to litigating in court if something goes wrong. Uh, and today we're going to cover basically four sections. Protecting your creativity. So this is the right structure itself. This is copyright law and how it applies. Um, the rights acquisition. Can you tell the story you want to tell? Do you have the right to tell the story? Do you have what you need to tell the story? The production legal. That aspect of while you're in production, the pre-production, production, post-production, post clearance. Do you have the rights? Who's looking over them? Do you have all the contracts? We're going to cover that. And then finally, budgeting and financing. I do want to give you a teaser. The budgeting and financing we're going to touch on today, but we're hoping to present a, uh, thanks, Chris, a, uh, uh, a 
another master class in connection with, with SLIP and November on budgeting and financing uh, and really dig deep, deeper because this is such an important part of the process. Um, and there are some real pitfalls if you don't know what you're doing. So starting with the first section, um, copyrights and contracts govern everything that we do. And, and the basic principle that we start with throughout the time, and this is just something basic to keep in mind, you guys are worried about every second that's going to end up on the screen because you, you're, that's your control. That's how you, this makes it, this doesn't. Cutting room floor, finished product. That's your thing. We want to make sure that every second that you fall in love with can get on the screen legally with no risk. So every second footage must be clear. And there needs to be one copyright owner for the film. Now, usually it's the producer, the production company, like the studio, or the financier, but there needs to be only one copyright in the finished film. And we'll get to how that works in a minute. And, and this is sort of the key about copyright ownership. And copyright law is the law that governs all of this. We will direct what copyright law does for us with the contracts that we use. But the thing about copyright law it fills in the blanks where your con where your contracts are lacking. So if you don't have something in your contract that you want to have, the Copyright Act will fill in the blanks and likely not the way you intend. The basic principle of copyright law is that the human who takes the concept and reduces it to some tangible form of expression, puts it on the film, records the music, whatever, holds the camera, is the copyright owner. Well, that's not going to work if you can only have one copyright owner for your film. So every human being who contributes anything to the film must sign a written word for hire agreement. That's got to be something that you just don't shoot without. Maybe you'll get lucky. But the reality is, if you're going to get into this, and we'll talk later about distribution deals, you get into distribution deal. If you get any kind of good distribution deal, you're going to have to provide the distributor with reps and warranties that you own all the rights, probably an insurance policy that says you own all the rights, and probably proof that you have all the rights. So copies of all of your appearance releases, copies of all of your crew deal memos, copies of all these things that show that you actually have the copyright for the film you're asking them to distribute. So make sure you get these from the start. And he, so what kind of risk would you fail to do that? So copyright. Well, it's a great question, Kara. And the risk is, as I said, from the start, every human being that does something creative is potentially the owner of whatever it was that they did in that moment. So you could have, and the way copyright law works, if everybody is a group of people, or two or three or five or whatever, are, are contributing something that's independently copyrighted, like if the camera person is just taking footage like this and going back and forth, and they just stop, that's all they did. That's copyright. That is copyrighted footage. It doesn't have to be good. It doesn't have to be artistic. It's copyright. So that work that that person did right there is independently copyrighted. But they intended it to be part of this film. Well, that's true of everybody. But if you don't have a written agreement saying everybody's assigning those rights into the film, you have a bunch of joint owners. Under copyright law, joint owners don't only own what they did, they own an interest in the whole thing. You could have 5, 10, 20 people who actually own the copyright in the film. Now, they have to share any money they made with each other. But if one wants to go out and sell it and the other says, no, I want to give it away for free, they're an owner. They can give it away for free and destroy the market. So you do not want to live in a world where you have joint ownership. It was messy. I have been in lawsuits where somebody got it wrong and we got to take our guitar player all the way up to Atlantic Records and sit and say, you should have paid him the 500 bucks if you owed him and had him sign a paragraph that he was willing to sign. But instead, that Grammy-nominated song with his guitar playing in it means we get to carve up the profits. And it's true. So you do not want to have that. That's a great question. This is one of those things. Yes, I... Um, I'll, excuse me. I'll soon from the script. I mean, from the get-go, you're going to be writing the script 
Right. And so you start, you start that. I mean, so great question. And, and we kind of, this is sort of the language that we're going to be working with. So, and films come together in all sorts of different ways, right? I mean, sometimes you start with a script. Depending on, on your particular skill set, I know we've got writers in the room. They start with a script. They're looking to have their script made into a film. Somebody else may be starting as a filmmaker production company that falls in love with a book or falls in love with a script or has an idea and wants to ask someone to write. However it comes together, the basic rule is everybody's got to contribute the copyright ownership into a fixed unit, whoever that's going to be, the production company. After. So if you're commissioning a script, if you're at the start and you're the production company, you have an idea and you say, hey, would you like to write this out? Get that person a special commission to work prior agreement. And you can, they're going to, they're going to do the work. You may pay them for that work or not. Um, you know, but you may agree that they, you have to have some consideration. So if you're not paying them for their day rate or their pages or something like that, you may say, but you'll get a credit and I'll, if we make money, you'll get a piece. Or, I mean, there, there are ways that you can compensate, but you need the written words in the contract to say that the work was commissioned to be part of a, com a compilation of audiovisual work and it's you're going to be the owner. And then we will have extra paragraphs in there just to make sure. But the point is, you really want to gather it because the way copyright works is copyright ownership comes into being at the instant of creation. So if the, if nothing's been created yet and everybody says, well, everything that I do is going to be a work for hire, great. Then everything that gets turned on all comes into the same. And then everybody gets compensated however they would really be compensated. If the script is already in play, well, then you're going to need to get an assignment of the, you know, hey, I have a script. I'd love you to make a film out of your script. Let's do a deal. Or maybe I hire you as a writer also, but we're going to start with the script and then we're going to turn it into the screenplay. But somewhere along the line, there needs to be this language that assigns the copyright into that. Yes? Um, what if, uh, if I want to do uh, if I'm on like MIT or a copy lab license, and, but somebody else wants to, can they? Stop if I, and I don't have the agreements beforehand. Can they stop me from? Uh, so, so what do you uh, do? You want to use something that someone else has already put out? No, I produce my own. Well, this is another question about does everybody who appears, if I'm just if I'm just uh, compiling editing video down from live events, does every and it's in public spaces, do I write any releases? Or well, so people? that and that's a great question. I mean, that's another aspect of. If, if the people have been in, um, say they come to a concert or a ball game or whatever it is, and if they have a ticket. I'm thinking more in a public space that they need to buy a ticket for. Well, but if they, so if they're just in public spaces, if they're not appearing, now if they're interviewing, if you're going to use them and they're identifiable, then the best practice is to have them sign an appearance release. Because now you're using their identity in some way and that that's, can, can be a problem. But if they're just, if you're crowd scenes, people in the park or whatever, you don't have an expectation of privacy walking around in public. You can, but but if you're filming, if you're doing something like that, it's still a very good practice to put up a poster or say an area release. You see those, right? When you walk in someplace or you go into an area, hey, be aware, you know, this is being recorded. You may be on camera. If you don't want to be on camera, don't come in. Um, so the person I'm interviewing, uh, I want to uh, widely distribute this. So I want to make it freely available. And, and but uh, I've already got stuff on YouTube. And so we did, I have a few examples of that. What, what, and I want to keep it up there public on YouTube. But what if they, can they come after me? They try to make this a like, uh, MIT or some kind well, of. Well, you, you, in order to do so, so really, the question is assuming you already are the copywriter, you probably are the copywriter because you're the camera person, the editor who created this thing. But the first, the people I speak to, exactly. I have to get their permission. And there's, and we're going to talk a little bit about those other rights in it. But that leads to that question because you don't only need the copyrights; you need other rights as well to own the ability to distribute every second of footage. And we're going to get to that in a second. But because in order to do, you can, if you own it, if you have the rights, you can put it out in the world however you want. You can absolutely put it out there freely available for others to take and use. But you can't do that if you don't have the right to do that. And so that's why we, 
As filmmakers, you may want to make a very lucrative career out of this, or you may just want to tell stories for the world and make them happen. All of that's cool. But in order for you to be able to put what you want onto the screen to live however you want it to live, you have to get all the rights from whoever else might be able to say no. And that's what we really want to make sure that we can help you avoid is falling in love with something that now you can't do what you want to do. Mine's real quick. Um, if you have people wearing multiple hats, like a composer who's also acting in the film, mm -hmm. you need separate work for hires stating which job they're doing. Yeah, I mean, you, it's not a bad idea, particularly for something like uh, a composite, you know, because a composer agreement may also have uh, performing right. They may be ASCAP BMI. They may have some other things that are part of their own creation. They, you know, and if you're dealing with people in SAG after and others, you may have to deal, you may need to segregate because they may get paid one way for this and then allowed to be paid differently for that. Right. But you, if you don't have those things, this, the language that would say is this person is being hired to do this and this and this, and all of the results and proceeds of the work that they do will be a work for hire. So that will, from a copyright perspective, you can capture it all, but there might be other reasons to do multiple agreements with the same person. Just to say, you may pay them differently, you know, they may get paid only a certain amount for this, but maybe something else for here, you know, they may get credit one way and so you might want to have them for that. Sure, gotcha. Um, but yeah, so this is just kind of a summary, right? Uh, copyright law, we want to get all of these things into the production company. So that the production company then can do a distribution deal and the, your film can see the world. And the production company then is going to do something with the film. Likely, and this is kind of an oversimplification, simplification, but generally they work down on these two types of approaches. One is I'm the production company, I've funded the film, I've got investment, whatever, it's done, I've made it, it's in the can. I'm gonna find a distribution company that is gonna distribute it for me, but I'm gonna be the copyright owner at all times. They're gonna take a commission on what they distribute, I'm gonna grant them a license. It might be international, it might be Wide, might be domestic, it might be just DOD and not theatrical, whatever. But it's a license that, as the copyright owner, I'm granting to them in return for which they're going to provide some services, try to sell it in other areas and markets, and then they're going to take a commission and pay me the rest. The other is if you have a financier who's paid for your film and your deal with them might be a studio, might be a, a hybrid studio network, could be a variety of different vehicles. But they may take an ownership of the copyright. You may, they may be paying you and they may be paying you back in and paying you additional royalties and other things like that, but they're going to be the owner of the copyright as part of the financing deal. And you're not. But you may be fine with that as long as you're getting comp and you're getting the pay the structure that you want. But they're then going to go out and the financiers are then going to go out into the distribution deal. And sometimes you'll get distribution deals that are a combination of a financier distribution deal, called backstop or negative financing and other things. We won't really get into those in great detail here, but be careful of the temptation of a distributor finance deal early on. It sounds great, but might actually have terms that really end up having you having to buy back your film and not getting much out of it. So just there's, Funding your film is one of the biggest challenges. So in the, you know, this first phase, so now, we, you know, we've got this basic copyright structure. That's for when the film is being made. But first, you need the rights to make the film you want to make. Um, and these kind of break down in two sections, fiction and nonfiction. In the fiction area, typically, so, you know, an, an independent film, a feature film, it's not based on anything. It might be based on a work, a, a book, a novel, or something, in which case you may do an option agreement to option the rights to the book. Or you may commission a script from scratch and do brand new screenplay, original screenplay. You're going to do that as a work for hire. But either way, you're going to need a written agreement, either an option agreement for the existing work 
or a work for hire agree for a new work in order to have the rights to tell the story in the first place. If you're in the nonfiction reality documentary world, you're not really, I mean, we, we call it unscripted. Of course, it's heavily scripted, right? If it's any good. But the point is, it didn't start from a beginning, it didn't, it's not a made-up world. And so, but you need rights to, to tell the people's story, perhaps. You might have a life rights agreement. You might have simply uh, different levels of talent or on-air appearance releases for the people whose stories are going to be told. You need access to locations. You need access to different people, different parts of their stories, things like that. So you might have some option agreements, some appearance agreements, some different things, but you'll still need the right to tell the story. So this early phase, when you're putting your thing together, you just lump it into this concept of rights acquisition. But it's a real important part. And a lot of times the structure of the agreements here will, you, you may not be paying anything up front, but you may be saying, if we get something made, then I will pay you something. That can vary. Here's an example, you know, in, in the, in the, we just sort of, I, I should have looked at my slides more closely because I just said everything about this slide. Um, but, you know, here's a, in, in a feature film. There's Doom is made obviously on famous novel. Lots and lots of reference works. I don't know how this most recent film, how the rights work, but they still had to get the rights to tell the story that was originally in Frank Herbert's book. So there were surely there were book option agreements and so forth. And then, but there's a new screenplay. So the new screenplay writer had to do a work for hire. Probably got a fee for the services, got credit. Um, Maybe some back end contingent compensation, et cetera. Maybe a lock to be the writer on future derivatives. Those are different terms that that screen. So you talk about your, you know, your script, like that same thing. You can thinking through ways to, you know, obviously film like this, the writer got paid a lot of money right out of the box. But if you don't have a lot of money, so there may be still other enticements for a writer to agree to write for you. Um, in the in the nonfiction, here's an example. You know, life rights. Um, it, it, there's a book. You want the book option. You, you want the life rights option. The person to tell their story. Um, these typically have an option price and a purchase price. So typically, the purchase price gets negotiated up front, and then the option is ten percent of the purchase price, and the option's paid right away. And then that buys 12, 18 months for the filmmaker to see if they can put together the rest of the financing, attach a director, attach a talent, whatever it might be, decide whether they can really make it. And if they do, then they'll exercise the option by paying the full purchase price. So that basic option structure is a way to sort of, and what you're really doing when you, when you do an option, whether it's a person's life rights or a book, you are essentially paying some small amount of money now to take that subject off the market for a while, to buy you the time to see if you can assemble the rest of whatever it is that you might need to finish the film. And if you can't, you're out the money you pay and they get to go their own way, but at least for a while, you've got the ability to try to put together. And you can go now to your financier, now to your talent and say, I own the option to this one. I'm the only one that gets to make this one. So you'll hear about books being option. That's what this is talking about. This is yes. So you have one here. I think you mentioned it, the fair use, and that's what I'm working on. Okay. I'm doing a, a tour with Albert King, a public figure, mm -hmm. and I've got musicians who also toured with him. We did a performance, and now we're calling myself making a documentary about it. So I was so Oh, thank you. So. Is that fair use? I don't have to go to his family who has their well, mess, there's a messy see, executive. See, I would, I would, I'm now I'm going to put on my real lawyer hat. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and I'm going to give you the lawyer, the answer that every lawyer should give you all the time and say, it depends. <laughs> um, because it does depend. It very well may be. What you're describing is, is and, and for those of you, and we could do an entire week long mesh class on fair use. But the concept of fair, everything we've been talking about so far is to gather the rights to existing copyrighted material. 
not the rights to, to show people. That's a separate set of rights, which we'll talk about in a second. But what you're talking about is playing that music, cap using old footage, concert footage, things like that. Those there is already a copyright in that footage that you want to put into your footage, right? So the question is, do I need the right? Do I need normally if I want to use footage that already exists and somebody else owns it, I want to put it in my I need the right, I need a release, I need a license, I need some permission from that person to include that in mine. Because otherwise it would be copyright infringement. I'm literally making another copy of their stuff and displaying it. But fair use gives us ways in which, if we, depending on our use, we may not have to ask permission. And some documentaries fit into that. It's uh, sometimes people think, oh, it's a documentary, that means fair use. That's it's not that clean cut. Or I'm a nonprofit, it means it's fair use. Those are they're not bright line rules like that. But if you're doing something, the original footage was produced to entertain. Yeah, it's us performing his so, music and a little pieces of him when we were performing with him. So if you're performing, so in that situation, the only thing you really need is if you're if you're making entirely new recordings, then there is no you're not playing previously recorded music. I have like one eighth of footage of so I can show people who he is and some footage okay. of me playing with him. So you you have a mix. The old footage, there's a copyright in that footage. There's a copyright in the film, if it was a film of a live recording. Inside that copyright is the copyright in the music itself. But if it's a live recording, it's not Capitol Records or whoever released the album, but it, it's still Albert or the songwriter who wrote the songs. Um, so there's some, but then there's whoever took that footage. It, was that from an old film? I mean, there's a copyright in that old footage. Yeah. Those are copyrights that normally you would say, I need to find out who owns those, get some sort of license for the permission to do so. And then, but you may have fair use arguments on that footage because you're doing something different. The original footage just showed was to entertain. Mm -hmm. You are telling a story. You're you're doing something different. You're educating. You're putting him in a in a cultural place in society. You're talking I mean, whatever it is that you're doing with your film. There may be a different purpose. And the U.S. Supreme Court is actually going to take a case this summer or fall where it's supposed to really help us make sure that that's still a valid fair use argument. We very closely watched case. About because one of the ways something can become fair use is if you're just doing that, I want to do something different with it. That's enough. It has been enough for a while. A recent case said it wasn't. Uh, Albert Andy Warhol, Prince Paintings case, is headed to the US Supreme Court now to decide this issue. That could play a big part in how you all think about what rights you need for yours. If you're playing music, live music yourself, there's no recorded footage, there's no capital records, there's no master recording you're using, but there's still the songwriter of the songs that you play. Yeah. yeah, but if you're doing um, a live performance, then you're singing with video, there's a sync license. That's a longer question, but but it's, but it's you're asking the right questions, and fair use very well may be your friend. Yeah, and that's the thing, I mean, the thing about fair use is basically in this concept, you know, in the nonfiction world, not only do you need copyrights for existing words, you need the right to tell the story of a person. Now, you do not need somebody's, a public figure, you can make a film about them without their permission. You're not going to get them to talk to the camera, but you can do it because they're a public figure. You're dead. They're, they're dead, and, and even if they're alive. I mean, pick any public figure. Like them, don't like them, doesn't matter. You make a positive, you get negative. We can talk about public figures in public. Mm -hmm. Very clear First Amendment rights to do that. We can say bad things about them. We can say good things about them. We can commentary. That's all permitted. But if you want to tell a, if you want them to be part of your thing, if you want them to talk on camera, you're going to need their, their appearance releases, things like that. If you want to use them in your commercials and make them a promotion, you're going to need their permission. Fair use in this context is the right to tell a story about a public figure without the permission. 
simply because they're a public good. But often you want to use them. You want them to be in your film, not just to be about them. Now, if someone's already dead, then you have a different. But maybe your family members you want to talk to, other people that want to appear on screen, the people that play with them. You know, you want to get appearance releases. All of, you, all of those people you want to have them say, not only do you have the right to, for me to appear, but anything I do that might be considered creative is also a work for hire. Yeah, I have a quick question. Yeah. I was watching a documentary last night and they said we tried to interview, but their attorneys said they did not. Mm -hmm. Interviewing, you have to have rights, but but their attorney said they did not be interviewed. No, we wouldn't have to do that. I think my guess is that because if you can if you can use if, if you're legally allowed to use talk about them without them being on there, you don't need to tell the people that you're legally allowed. Okay. You know what I mean? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. My guess is that that was done for editorial purposes. Right. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. I was like, they definitely did that for like an extra aspect. Yeah. The I mean, just to, and sort of say, when you yeah, get the chance, right. you know, James R. Bond, right. and, you know, you see that a lot. Um, but no, and that's the, that's the public figure. It, you know, we, we can tell stories about public figures. Um, can't tell lies. You can defame them. There, there's limits, but you don't need their permission to, you know, that for that purpose with, within limits. And that leads us to production. Like you've got the rights, you've acquired the rights to make it. Now you're into the production. All of these are contracts, appearance releases. Any human that's going to appear on the screen, they can be very simple. You know, for a bunch of extras. A simple one-page appearance release is probably perfectly fine. Talent that's got a speaking role, you probably want to have a little bit longer, but it's still going to be the basic stuff. And it's basically going to say where they are, what role they're doing, what days, what the shoot times are. If they're a union, you're going to have to deal with issues there um, once you're compensating them. But one of the key points is they agree that the results and proceeds of their work are work for hire. The production company is going to own the company. A materials release. This is this doesn't come in so much in a in a scripted film because in a scripted film, feature film, you control the entire set. You stage everything you shoot. You don't get away with you can't oh that accidentally got it because you have complete control of the set. But in a documentary, you may have to take the world as you find it. You may have to go on location and you're going to be on location in a place that's a real location. And that location may have a bunch of copyrighted photographs on the wall and posters and other things and stuff. And that's where they are. In order, you don't have to track down who owns the copyright and the print that they've got a target on the wall. But you need a materials release from the location that says all of the materials that are present, you have the right, I own them, I have the right to own them and display them. You are displaying in my place, I give you the right to display them also. So we did a lot of times we'll combine materials release and location agreement just to sort of capture those two in the documentary. If you yeah, wait, so as my question, it say talent I'm working with um this kind of advice, I'm asking for advice. Do you find it's better to to roll as many uh, of these um contracts into a single document with fewer signatures or it's kind of it's kind of like the question that we have before. It really just depends. If you have if you have one person slash business location that's sort of fulfilling multiple things, you can combine them into one agreement. If they have if the pieces are all in there, and we do that, you know, we we have libraries of you know here's here's sort of a basic appearance release we would build for you. Here's a location, but here's a location with materials. Here's a location with materials plus the, you know, so we can, you can combine them. Um, the key thing, what I think is helpful, and, and hopefully you'll find slides like this helpful when you get them. Remember that these are distinct buckets. Each of these things does something different than the other. You can combine them, but you may not be able to in every circumstance. But don't forget that you need one of these if you are using old film footage on something, you know, you're doing a documentary, you want to have some old footage, you're going to need the rights to use that footage. Now, maybe it fits under fair use, but you have to have a lawyer analyze that. 
you have to get a, a parents, you know, or a, a license to use that footage if that's what you want to use. The clearance aspect of production legal, that's when and we do this for clients all the time. You get to, you've got a rough cut of your film and you're ready to let us watch it. And we'll say, hey, that, you know, there's Coca Cola over there. That guy's got a Martin Guitar shirt or whatever it might be. What's the deal? Do they have to be a black, you know, that's the things we're looking for. We're looking for to make sure now, you know, in a scripted, you don't, like I said, you don't get away with these things. You're going to have to, um, you, you have control over the set. But if we see something that popped in on, oops, accidentally, all right, maybe that's got to be blurred. We got to figure out how to deal with that. But that's the, the clearance part of the production legal work that the lawyers will do for you is at the end or very close to the end. You may still have color correction. You may still have some final time, but we're going to listen for music. Hey, there's music. We have rights to that. Because what we were, we're going to like double check along the way. Okay, and we'll do it and give you back a report with time codes. Hey, here to here, this person on. Do we have a right for this? Where did this come from? Who's this? Where's this music? Whatever. Now, if we've done all that, we may be able to go, oh, yeah, you know, we have a double check. But if you have a line producer or somebody whose role is kind of assembling all of these things, that's the conversation you would be having with them as sort of the final step so that this can go out. And if there's going to be things in there that are going to rely on fair use, well, then we've got to make sure there's a fair use of legal opinion. Because your insurance company, we talk about insurance, is likely to demand that if you're going to rely on fair use, you have a legal opinion that says it's fair use, so that they will then cover if you get sued. Um, and these are all of the different, these slides, you can look at a little more detail. This is kind of how some of these different contracts and things that they go. Um, and this is just kind of the way that they will work together provide things that they provide. And this, as you can see here, some of them get combined, you know, but, but each has an important role. Yes. So with materials, because like I understand the clearance part, like if I'm going to move right up the speech of water, mm -hmm. probably not clear. Um, however, like say you're shooting in a bar and the owner has the right to display the Miller Lite you right. know, neon sign, do you then, if you get a materials contract sign? Well, it depends. What it, is your film of fiction or is it a documentary or is it yeah, let's say fiction. Then you would need to Clear. get rights or put a different neon sign. Yeah. I mean, and, and conceivably there might be, you know, I should, I should say it depends. And then give me my answer. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, but I think the simplest thing is to keep in mind the difference between uh, a, a, a fiction, a work of fiction, in which the filmmaker creates the entire universe. And therefore, cannot say, well, this was there because it didn't exist until you created it. A documentary filmmaker at least gets the ability to say, I took the world the way I found it. Now, we may still say, well, put your camera over there so we don't have a bunch of clearance issues and all this stuff won't show up. Right? I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't mean you have no clearance obligations in documentary film. You still do. Yeah. But there's more that you can capture in a materials release because I want to show that this was at, you know, the Duck Room, for example, legendary music club. And this was what it was like when Chuck, and I want to go back in the green room and all the signatures and the posters back there and the old Chuck Berry pictures. I don't mean to find out who took the photograph or who was the copyright in that Chuck Berry picture because I'm at the Duck Room and I'm allowed to be there. And I'm not saying this is some other made up water. I'm saying it's the Duck Room and it's a document. So in that sense, you can you have more freedom, but you still need the right from the owner. That's the materials portion of the location agreement to say you can do this. In this case, does he have to go to the legal department and ask for the permission of what light neon sign? And if it's a, possibly, yeah. Whoever owns that, you know, because that's a trademark issue. And so whoever owns the trademark, um, you would go to the trademark. And also, isn't that a potential sponsor? Well, I mean, that might be, product, product. well, sure. I mean, there's a lot of different ways to do it. You know, I mean, Fiji Water shows up and shows all the time. So Starbucks, so does anything else. It just, but that's a deal. That's, and if your budget supports it, great. 
If your budget supported all that, though, you probably wouldn't be here. Uh, <laughs> probably already. So but then call me if you get there, because I love working on big budget stuff too. So that, oh, sorry. I'm gonna, I'm gonna I'm just piggyback on the question. And when you said the documentaries, uh, they find the world as they have it. And you have musicians that drink Pepsi, drink this type of water, drink this, this, that, you know, are those potential sponsors? Or is that something you have to get clear? See, again, similar sort of thing. I mean, I say you, you, you take the world as you find it. That's true. You also govern yourself before you turn your camera. And, you know, it, it, the casual, there's a bunch of people at the bar scene, you're not focusing in on the label, and somebody's got Bud, and somebody's got Miller, and somebody's got a cocktail, and they're doing this, and it's, you know, and it's just, woo, 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 but that's probably fun. But if it's, you know, if, if this was instead of a, one of our clients' energy drinks out there, I should probably have a label on and give a client. <laughs> Angry <laughs> Angel, by the way. Go get it delicious. Um, <laughs> Uh, That'll be in the recording. Right, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's where Doug up. Uh, <laughs> but you know, if if I've got the Budweiser and it's and we're gonna spend time with, and I got the label, so you can. What you risk? The question in those situations is: Are you creating an impression that Budweiser sponsors you? And it's a it's a it's a that's the trademark question. Copyright question, either you have the rights or you don't. Trademark question is, are you using this in some way? Are you infringing the trademark in some way? Now, clearly, you're not selling a competing beverage, so it's not classic trademark infringement. But you can get in trouble under trademark law by creating an impression of an association that doesn't exist, as if they approve of your film. And, it, and so when you see things in there, then you need to have a product placement deal. And then you'll in your credit somewhere, then you'll have promotional consideration provided by the Coca-Cola company or whatever, you know. So that's the kind of stuff that it, it, it could be a sponsor if it's, I mean, if, if you have this great footage and they all have been drinking Budweiser for 40 years and they want to tell you about it, you may go to AB and say, hey, we're doing a film about these jazz legends. And you know what? They love your beer. We have a sponsor. I mean, that might be a thing you do. But even though you take the world as you find it, you may not take things off the wall necessarily, but you can have the people drink a different drink when you turn the cameras on. And so it's kind of a continuum. Does that help? So clear. So, so no, don't, don't, believe me, no one apologizes for anything. Dialogue is fantastic. Okay. Um, yeah, so I'm wondering, like in a fictional film, can you, like, say you have a Toyota Corolla, that's what the main character drives, mm -hmm. and it's often seen, it's clearly a Toyota Corolla. Is that something you need clearance on? Typically, yeah, yeah, in fiction. I mean, you'll see. That's why you'll see in different films. You know, why is every vehicle here a four? Yeah. Well, it's because Ford they did deal. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so you know, and if it's if, if if the Toyota Corolla being a Toyota Corolla is not part of the story, it just happens to be the small car that the person drives, and what matters is that you drive a small car. Blur the logo. You can do that. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, I mean, if they can't, they don't own the rights and the shape of the vehicle. And they might think they do, but okay. they don't. Okay. They, I, you know, not now. <clears throat> maybe a Volkswagen bug can pretend to be something else. <laughs> yeah. um, and again, it, it, some of these things are along a continuum of how how uh, how extensive is the use. But certainly, logos and cars get blurred all the time, or are paid. Yeah, and frankly, you may not have to pay them; they may be happy to pay you to include their cars. It's not necessarily that you have to buy that. Right? So, but it's worth it's worth double checking. Yeah, and 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 hopefully, the, one of the, the main takeaways I we always want. There's nothing worse for us as lawyers. When we're doing the, the final clearance review, we have to tell our clients that they can't use footage they fall in love. So that's going to happen sometimes, hopefully less and less. But if you have some sense up, and so at the end of this, we're going to tell you, talk to your lawyers early in the process. Because when you're conceiving of your creative, 
if you have a sense of, particularly, this is probably more true in the documentary space. In the creative, in the, in the fiction world, you're creating your whole universe anyway. But in these other worlds where these, some of these blurry lines, think about what it is that you want to do and talk ahead of time. Okay, are we going to have a problem clearing this? Or can we make a fair use argument or whatever? So that when you're blocking and tackling it early, when you're figuring out how many, you know, how many camera angles am I going to need? How many days am I going to need to shoot this scene? Whatever it is, that's going to impact your budget. So if your budget is limited, then don't do things that you have to throw out that day's footage because you didn't stop to think about it. I shouldn't have had that giant Amico sign in the back the whole time. You know, I mean, that's an oversimplification, but it's happened. So, that, and, and, and as filmmakers, we do fall in love with footage. We were watching the dailies, like, oh, God, that's fantastic. And then there's that thing in the back, and you're like, oh, man. So, to the extent you can, if you have questions about whether this, I want to do something I haven't done before. Are there some things I should watch out for when I'm shooting? Have that conversation in front of you, you can. It can really help. Oh yeah. Um, okay, so I'm big on like be as safe, safe rather than sorry. Uh, in terms of things that are on screen, I guess I'm just wondering for like script or dialogue, uh, is that all under the same umbrella, or is that a separate legal issue? Well, so script and dialogue. Um, are you talking like? Like a new, like an entirely new screenplay, or yeah, yeah, like just or even like, adapting the book or putting different dialogue. Yeah, okay. Let's say brand new screenplay, just like some kind of product name. Should that be avoided oh, at all costs, or, or is that under the same is so like, or so, is that a separate legal so that's department? A, that's <laughs> a great question because it's a little bit different, right? It's it's um, and and it, it it'll go along a little bit. That is probably much more likely fits under an area of trademark law called nominative fair use. It's another type of fair use. And nominative meaning I get to use the name. And so cases have been developed over the years that say, you know, I if I like it comes up in comparative advertising. Pepsi can run an ad saying we're better than Coke, even though Coke is Coca-Cola is trademark. Because they don't, they're not required under the law to say Pepsi is better than that. Other cola that's made by the company in Atlanta that has that weird bottle and has that red thing. It's just like oh, I'm just naming it. There's no because in so doing, you're not creating any impression that Coca-Cola sponsored the Pepsi ad. Well, same thing goes in your script. If your character loves Coca-Cola or loves Budweiser or loves whatever, then that's part of their character. You can use the name of the thing that they love. Because that doesn't mean Coca-Cola sponsored your script. Nobody's going to be confused by that. So you can use the name of it without showing it on screen? And you can sure. Yeah, that's a different, because then they're just sort of, there. it's part of the conversation. It's part of it. Now, if your screenplay says, have person holding a Coke can, well, that may be okay up to a point, and then after a while, it's like, well, wait, now it looks like product. So, and if... It, Part of the story is I want to talk about this brand. And maybe some things I'm going to say are not good. Well, then you're not creating an impression that folks sponsored it. It's one of those it depends things. But it's worth getting, depending on the nature of really the quantum of the usage that you want to do, you could cross over into maybe we might suggest a little less of this or see the advice. But no, just having it in the dialogue, that's not. That's not going to be an issue. All right. Finance. So you've got your ideas. We know everybody's signing your work prior agreements. You've got all the rights. You're ready to shoot. How are you going to pay for it? Um, this is the, one of the biggest challenges, as I'm sure you all know. And there, while this we, we break this down into two buckets here. They're not really the only two, but they kind most things kind of fit into one of these two different areas. And what the difference really comes into, when are you selling? Are you selling, are you selling 
before you created it. Maybe to a financier, network, studio, production company where they're going to come in and pay for the whole thing and they're going to take it, the ownership. You're just pitching a concept to somebody and you're going to get compensated for your concept. But someone else is going to control the budget, going to control all the money. They're going to negotiate the distribution deals and you're going to get paid whatever you're going to get paid. Maybe you're going to sell it outright, you can get some back end, you can get whatever it might be, but you're, it's really not going to be yours to do, you know. But the beauty is you didn't have to go out and raise a lot of money because somebody came in and said, we love your idea. Netflix, we want to make this a Netflix original. Here's $5 million. But guess what? It's not really here's $5 million. It's we are going to make this for $5 million. We're going to give you this credit. You're going to have this role. We're going to do this. We're going to tax these people all that. It's good for you. You're getting your film in. But it's not, it's, it's your film only to the extent that that's how much they've left you to be your film. Not a bad problem to have, but also sometimes kind of a unicorn in the independent film. The other is you do independent finance. You are personally, you, and I'm, when I say you, I'm talking about whoever's going to own the contract. So let's say you are functionally the production company. Um, you're going to raise the money. Friends, family, credit cards, private investors, whatever else. But that's the concept that we'll probably some more time talking about here. Um, you know, like this is the this is the big you know sell the concept of finance. Network studio production company, they're gonna fund the entire budget. They're likely to take some creative control, maybe a lot of creative control. They may need to see dailies. And they're going to get executive producer credit. They may be putting people on your crew. It's really not your film so much. Anymore. It was your concept that you sold to which is great, but it's not the same thing as it being your um, You, as a production company, might get a fee equal to 10% of the budget as your comp, as your pay for managing everything. Um, you might get some contingent compensation, some back end, some product participation. But really, you're selling the concept to somebody else to make it. The independent, you're raising the money, typically from private investors, sometimes foundations in the documentary world. We have a, a client that Karen and I have a lot of work with right now. Um, tell tell me about it, but I, I think this is the coolest project that we have right now. The Brenda's project. Okay, yeah. So she's going around to different um, schools and she's doing documentary about women's basketball. So some of the first women's basketball coaches in lots of venues, but it has definitely come with a lot of work of just releases and budgeting and all of that. So yeah. it's like a cool project ever though. So yeah, yeah. It's, it, it's called If Not For Them. Mm -hmm. And it really tell it. So our client is a, uh, uh, her name is Brenda Van Lang and she is a ESPN women's basketball announcer. And she is doing this. She's raising money through found private foundations to fund this. She wants to do a 10 episode Netflix series or independent film or whatever, but really all these legendary women coaches, many of whom are, are quite old now. And a lot of historically black colleges and universities, a lot of these small places where getting permission to get inside there and tell their story and shoot there. These are jealously guarded, you know, they've had people say bad things about them. And it's, it's a fat, you know, even a three paragraph parent, you've done like even nine the, versions. Of yeah, the, the coaches will come scared she's going to say something bad or even the college has had bad experience with someone talking bad about the college. So there's yeah. a lot that goes into that, of just reassuring and like adding language within each agreement that's kind of modified for each location or person. Yeah, we, I mean, we started with a fairly standard appearance release and location agreement, but every one of these places comes back with a slight tweak to it. And that's why, you know, we, we, we do work with our filmmaker clients. We do create packages of, of agreements for you to use. And many of them may get used, but just sign them. But sometimes you get, everyone comes back with a slightly different tweak. They have the same concern. But they worry about it in a different way. So sometimes what we have to sit down with our filmmaking clients is just to say, um, 
what we absolutely have to have out of this thing is their permission to shoot and us to own the footage. There's other language we'd like to get, but we can give all that up as long as we get that. And we can promise that we're not going to, you know, normally we want to, you, filmmaker, you want the right to do whatever you want with the editing. So you want your agreements to say, once I've shot you, I can do whatever I want with that footage. You don't want to be told how to edit. But if you want to tell somebody's story in a documentary world, you may have to promise them that you're not going to do it the way that will cast them in a negative way. And that may be your intention. You may say that to them, but they may need you to put that in the contract. And so it's an interesting way. But what's interesting about this one for us also is that our financing is coming all through private foundations. And she's working with a uh, film production company whose job it is to, that is set up as a nonprofit, 501c3. They take foundation donations into them and then they fund film projects. So Brenda, our client, didn't have to set up a nonprofit herself. She can just be a for profit entity, hire a physical production company. She's the overall producer. But the financing is coming by people making tax deductible donations through foundations into this 501c3. And part of its mission is to tell stories that wouldn't otherwise be told. It's an interesting dynamic if you're in the documentary space and looking for funding. Depending on the story you're telling, you may find foundations that are looking to give money to people who want to tell the stories. Yes? What if there's a negative thing to say about someone and it's true? Well, I mean, not every foundation wants to sugarcoat what they did. I mean, yeah, you may run into that. And, and this is one of the things when you're when you're taking other people's money, sometimes they get to tell you what you have to do with their money. No, I meant I meant the uh, the subject of your documentary. Well, same thing. You have to decide if you how important is me being able to have this human speak in my film. If it's really important to me, and the only way they will agree is if I promise that nothing in the film will cast them in a negative light, then you have to decide, is it more important to my story to have this other piece of person tell the part of the story that made this person look bad or not? I mean, you know what I mean? It's it's one of those, and, and, and that's why you start with your appearance release saying, you agreed just to appear, I'm making a documentary about this whole thing, you were a part of it, and you agree that I can use the footage any way, shape, or form, and that's all it says. It's only if they push back and insist that you promise this, and then you have to make a decision as a filmmaker, can I live up to that contractual promise? You know, and sometimes we say, well, maybe you can't say that all the way because you just don't know. The story itself requires, includes some things about this person that maybe they're not proud of. But what you can often agree is that you won't edit their footage in any way that changes the meaning of the words that they said to you, right? Because that can happen in, in the reality world, especially. You see it all the time. You know, there's a, an hour long thing edited into seven minutes, and it's picked and choose and it's reversed ordered, and it makes them sound like it's a horrible thing, and then it's not what they said. <laughs> I, we, had, we had a client that was wanted to be, you know, the have you seen the show Below Decks? I do you, do you like Below Decks? No, it. oh, it's, it's about right. It's like these luxury cruises where the main, the, the 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 recurring characters are the crew. They live below decks, but each episode is about a different group of people, obnoxious rich people. Who are horrible people, obnoxious, or at least they're captured being horrible, who get drunk and do the malls and have affairs and do a thousand different things, and the people below decks talk about them. the whole show. Oh, oh it's <laughs> it. It's in its like ninth season on Bro. I mean, it's just, you know. But we had a client who, we had a client here who, who was, had a group of friends and like, this might be fun to go on. So they asked us to look at the contract that they were And it had all this language. You agree that. Your footage can be edited differently. You can do this. You can be cast in a negative light. You, can, you said things you didn't happen. You are coming on to a television show. You read all this. And when I and I edited back and I said, well, this is what all this means. We can try to change some of these things. 
And the producers are like, people lining up and want to be on the show. So sometimes these things are written where the filmmakers can do absolutely anything they want with your stuff. You as a documentary filmmaker are probably not do that, but you may have to decide along the way whether you're willing to give up some editorial control in order to get someone to participate. And that's the same thing sometimes with money. What am I going to have to give up in order to get this person's money? Yeah. I don't know if this is a dumb question, but um, I don't even make documentaries. Now I'm just curious. <laughs> like if, um, say that someone puts uh, some amount of money in your bill and then they're later found um, that they're being represented in a way that they don't like, and, but their money has already been spent like for the production, what, what happens? Like, well, they can't pull their money out. No, right? and see, that's why, again, when, you, when you're when you going to be taking, so let me, I'm going to come back to that. Okay. A little bit. So this is just a basic structure that we have used often that is that fits in sort of the generally understood independent film financing. And that's where the production company sets up an independent entity, doesn't do anything else. It's not the same as the entity of the production company. It's a new LLC that exists for the sole purpose of owning the film and producing the film. All of the money for the, for the investment, everything budget will go in there. That entity will control. Now, the physical production company is probably going to be managing that and handling the budget and everything. But the typical arrangement then is the sweat equity group is the producer. And it's typically a 50 50 split. I said 51 49 because sometimes you just need to keep a little tiny bit of control in the production company. But the basic structure is roughly 50-50 split in terms of ownership of the entity that owns the film. And then the investors get paid out of first dollars in it until they get all of their money back, typically plus 20%, sometimes plus 10%, before the producer group gets any of the money. So the producer group has to make sure that the budget, if the producer group includes people who are going to be spending days and days and days, working on the film, they have to get paid out of that, out of the budget. So we'll talk about that in the budget in a second. Because if you were going to have to hire someone else to do that, you're doing it anyway, you should count that in the budget. Um, but to your point about what if they don't like it? When you are getting these, these agreements, see this blank for a second, I'm going to come up in a second, this second. When you are taking money from someone, you're going to do so in an agreement, written agreement. If they're, if you're using a structure like this, they may be investors into an LLC, in which case they're signing an operating agreement and so forth. If they're, if they're other, there's other types of vehicles, documents that are covered, but they are, you are, you can make sure that those people understand that in giving you the money, they are taking the risk that they're never going to see a penny back. You make, no one may like your film. Um, May not get a distributor, maybe whatever, right? But, and they are giving up control. They cannot take it back. One of the things that we didn't mention here, but we've had to, to, to explain to a lot of clients, in almost every other contract of any other type of business, if, if Karen and I have a contract and I breach that contract, Karen may be able to sue me for damages, money that I owe her if that's, if that's the issue. But she also, if I've done certain things, she may have the right to go into court and get a, an injunction to order me to stop it. Particularly in the intellectual property world. If I'm in, infringing her intellectual property in some way, one of the things that you can go into court right away is, judge, this is my intellectual property that you're using. It's showing up on the screens. You need an order to stop. And the judge will order it, take it down. Go to Facebook, get a takedown notice if your footage is up there. Intellectual property typically is the type of property that the courts will enforce an injunction against, meaning I can get it taken down. But in a film world, if you're a production company, you're assembling rights early on. You need every single one of those people to agree that if we breach somehow, the only thing you can do is sue us for money. You give up your right to go into court to get an injunction because it cannot take the chance that the owner of a photograph in the back of a film thinks 
that their stuff shouldn't have been in the materials released and walk into a judge that doesn't know anything about the energy and convince them to issue an order that requires the film production to stop. Because no studio will ever distribute my film, nobody will take it if all of these potential injunctions are walking around. So it's just this little kind of thing. So to your point, under your scenario, if you didn't have the right kind of written language, that person may say, wait a second, I want that taken down. I want you know, like, no, 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 no. You so so the, the trust point has to come at the start of the investment. Do I believe in you as a filmmaker? Have you convinced me that the story you're going to tell is one I want to put my money behind? I'm willing to trust you as a filmmaker. That's what it comes down to. Um Provided that you didn't tell them all you were going to make a film that said this and then lied and did something else. You, you conceivably could still open yourself up to some problem. But generally speaking, no. The, the whole point of doing the investment correctly is so that once that money's in there, you are free to make the film. And we're going to talk about what that means here. You have got to develop a realistic and true budget. This is... I think the single most important aspect of this process. It's where more projects fail than any others. We have clients right now who are investing in films or trying to, this is the lack of a because they've already made up their mind. They can already visualize their daughter in the bartender's. They've already decided it would, they have enough money here that they'd like to get an IMDb executive producer credit. That'd be cool. They want to give their money, but the producers can't quite get the budget right, and they can't do this. And we keep having to say, "Come on, our, our dad wants to give you the money. Please do this part correctly so that we can tell them it's okay." Um, and this is where it comes down to, and. The biggest issue, so the budget, these are all buckets that should be included in every budget. And some may have little or no impact on yours, some may be really big. Talent may be the largest part of your budget or the tiniest part. Same with locations. Are you going all over the world? Are you doing like Game of Thrones? Or are you shooting everything in your backyard? Um, music licensing can be a massive swing on. Are you doing, you know, small independent people are just happy to have their music in a movie for 500 bucks, or do you want to use, you know, the entire Bob Dylan catalog, which you can't do? You know, and any, or anywhere in between. Oh, I love it, man, that pink song. It's so great this scene. Well, pink. It's probably not going to be. But these are the types of things that you need to consider. Down at the, in marketing and distribution, how are you going to get this thing out there? Are you going to, you know, hopefully you're going to get a distributor interested in taking over, but are you going to have to enter it in festivals first to shop at the distributors? How are you going to get there? Are there entry fees? Are there, you know, do you want to hire somebody to run a social media campaign? What you think about, how am I going to get my film to the world? How am I going to get my film to distributors? Do I need to include extra money in my budget because the point of doing this exercise now is when you go out to investors, you're going to say, I need this much money to do all of these things. And a smart investor, if they don't see that you have a line item and an explanation for each one of these types of buckets, they're going to, what about music? Oh, that's right. Oh, sorry, you're not my, you know, I'm going to talk to the next person. So that's why all these buckets are important to the budget. They may all have different values in any production. Do you find that, no, you go ahead. I just had a quick question. Sure. Do you find that producers underestimate or overestimate? I think they underestimate. And that's what I was about to say. One of my favorite ways Pete explains to uh, producers is you need to have a, a maximum and a minimum. At a minimum, you're making the movie and you probably have to take out car crashes. You probably don't get this person as talent. But that's at our minimum. But we're going to still make a good film. Then we have a maximum. We have all the top name talent and you have all the scenes you want and things like that. So it's kind of like wish. Yes, yeah, so you have options. Yeah. Like if we get the financing, we can make this incredible film. And if we get this much, we're still going to make the film. It just may not have all the things you want in the beginning. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's exactly right. And the, and the reason for having that, um, well, here, I want to make a I'll let's go ahead for that point. The reason for having that minimum and maximum is when you're asking for the first dollars, right? Let's say, you, let's just say you, you're, you think you can, you can make this movie, it's going to be $500,000. Just pick a number out there. And that's doing everything that's with the scenes I want. And I really, you know, and I've got all these buckets and I know who my talent's going to be, whatever. But if I got 350, I could still finish the film. Tell the same story in a way that I would be proud of. And I think I can get this extra. So if I get this extra, I think I can make it even better. But I can still make this film for here. If you do both of those things, then when you go to investors, the first $50,000, $100,000, with that, if, if you only get that person's money, you can't make your film. But if your documents don't mean what, what you really have to say to them is, we won't spend any money at all until we have hit that minimum number that we can viably produce a film. The, so that first money in, it's a convertible note, it's a it's a loan, it's got interest, it's sitting in an escrow account, and if a date comes and we haven't raised enough to hit that minimum number, you get it back with interest. I can't spend on pre-production. I can't spend it traveling around and doing whatever. It is not there to spend until I know I have enough to finish the film. I mean, and think about it. If you if you can say that to your investors and believe it and explain it and show them how that 350 will get spent and convince them that will finish the film, then they may give because you gotta get the first dollars before you can get the second, the third, or the fourth. Then once you go over, so one of the vehicles that we use in the LLC environment is that first, let's use the 500 and 350 example. The first 500 or the first 350 is done as a convertible note, a, a, a loan agreement that converts into an investment once you hit the threshold 350. Once you've got that much in, all that first money converts. It's no longer a loan. It's no longer something that has to be paid back possibly. It converts fully into this investment. Now, you don't owe that money back to these people in the sense that you owe a loan. What you owe them is the promise that you made to finish the film the best you can. And they and you are both taking the risk that enough people will watch that film and pay for it so that you'll be able to pay the person back. But the real risk is getting into a financing structure where you're taking money in and you're spending it as you take it in, but you never quite get enough to finish the film. And there isn't a vehicle to pay the people back. There's nothing that's ever going to rain profits. And that's really bad if you're an investor, but it's really bad if you're a filmmaker too, because it'll be the only time you're ever getting. I mean, that will, you know, it's not a big community. People know kind of the people that can make a film and pay their investors back can do it again. So this concept that Karen and I were talking about of having a minimum and maximum becomes really, really important. And one of the things that is when that bucket, that one down at the end, production legal. You've got to have production legal. You've got to have the contracts. You've got to have somebody making sure you have the rights. You've got to make sure you have the right music licenses. You've got to have a fair use analysis that's important. If you don't have production legal in your budget, the investors will say, where's that? So put it as a line item in the budget. We, do, we would do production legal work, and we get paid as a line item out of the budget. Sometimes that pays us way more than our hourly rate. Sometimes it pays us a fair amount less than our hourly rate. But it removes this sort of hourly billing thing. Well, I think I should call it lawyer, but I don't want to. We're all lined up. I'm, we're, we're a functional part of the crew. We are part of the team that's working together to get this thing productive. Sometimes we work as a production of the budget and we get a percentage of the back end. Percentage of the back end is a great thing to get. Rarely ever generates any real money. But if someone really took off, sure, we can participate in that too. But the point is you have to account for that in your budget. You have to account for music in your budget. You have to account, I don't even have it on here, insurance. 
you know, these are all things that need to be in your budget. Um, and so this is just an example. These percentages are nothing magic, but it's just an idea that you, you may break down your budget in different ways. 3% might be the right, one and a, if it's a really big budget film, maybe one and a half percent for production label. If it's a small budget film, it could be as much as 10%. But the point is, there's a percentage of the budget that it gets assigned for the production legal aspect, which includes all those contracts, the review, conversations, questions about clearance, all the things that come up, negotiating with distributors, all of that stuff comes out of the budget. So it needs to be shown in the investors when you're going out seeking investment money, the, the production company should be able to show you the budget. Here's exactly how we're going to spend your money. Um, because as investors, you want to have confidence. You're willing to take the risk that you guess wrong and this is not going to be an interesting film. But that's the only risk the investor should take. The investor should not take the risk that you're not even going to finish it because you forgot something. So that's really the conversation. And you all as filmmakers are seeking financing. Don't let the, the money think that you don't know what you're doing because you forgot some key aspect. So if nothing else, take that as a bucket to, to make sure you have the look. Yes? For the, uh, in the, for, on the production company, should you put budget in for payment for yourself? Yes, absolutely. So, so that was the thing I was going to say. So let's say you are... Um, you're the production company, but you're also the writer, or you're also the director, or the line producer, or the editor, or maybe oh, a bunch of them. Yeah, no, 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 no. Okay, no, no, no. I, hey, I hear you. Well, so think of it this way. I, I think, it, yes. Now, and here's why. If you did not have you to do those tasks, you'd have to pay someone to do the tasks. They are necessary tasks to finish the film. You should build your budget with what it would cost if you had to pay every single human being to do every bit of work necessary at their regular rates. And then if you need to give yourself a break by charging less or something else, I mean, maybe as a production company, you're also going to participate in profits if they're profits. Your crew is not. So you got to pay my crew and I can defer my own salary. But I still should start my budget assuming I've got to pay for each of these tasks. That does a couple of things. One, it, it, what if you get sick? What if happens if something happens and you got to hire somebody to replace you? You've got to have a budget for that. And secondly, it builds you discipline because the next film you make might make you, you're not going to do all those things. And you build the discipline of having, this is how I build a budget. This is how I build a structure. And then my wife has a saying that the, um, the best thing about plans is that you have something to depart from. Okay? You can depart from your budget after you've built it. But build it correctly first. Does that make sense? Yeah. Right. Yes. Uh, you mentioned deferred payment there. And it's, I, I'm not sure how that works. Like if I... And if I say I'm paying myself, but I don't, I don't want to report on taxes if that money is not. So I have to do this work before I actually get the financing, so I, I can add up some. I, I keep track of my hours until I actually have money come in. Yeah, I mean, you, you, I will. I mean, anytime you're getting into things like that, don't talk to me. Talk to your account. But the concept that I'm talking about is, say, I'm it, it's. Because it's not so much deferred comp. I don't think it's so much deferred compensation that might get into a 409A tax issue kind of thing. But more of, um, because you're not guaranteeing yourself this money later. But in the situation where you are the production company, but you are you own the production company, that's going to have this 50% ownership of the film. And after you've paid your money back, your investors back, if it's making more profit, you're going to be the one that gets that. But during the production, you are also the person standing behind the camera, right, doing these tasks. Those tasks have a value. They would have to be paid to someone. If you're going to want to doing that, you would normally get $10,000 for that work, your normal rate. You might agree to do it for $5,000. 
so that you have a little bit more in your budget to do a little bit more here, or just some cushion. You might agree that I'm going to take 5,000 and I'm only going to take my other 5,000 if we finish on time and on budget, because you may get into them, you may work the whole. But the point is you are essentially agreeing with yourself that the human me is going to allow my company a little bit of a break so that other things can happen. But that really can't happen until you first decide what is the fair market value of the services I'm providing to this film. And if you to do it right, you should get paid for that. You should get paid for the services you're providing because the film may not make a profit. Maybe it will be very successful, but only successful enough to pay your investors back. That puts it in a small group of successful films. But if the only way you're ever going to make money in is, is profit afterwards, that's fine if you have a day job and you're just putting the money together. But it's not fine if you're the person putting all the sweat and you could have been doing something else with money. You should pay yourself because you're providing a service. Because the only guarantee that you're going to get any money for that work is to be paid for the service that you're providing. Because everything else depends on people buying tickets to the phone. Right? And that may or may not happen. We all know that as creators. Put our work out in the world. People may love it, they may not. We may love it, our family may love it. We may all watch it at Christmas and they, they never get on Netflix. Um, that might be very successful, in which case, terrific. Then you have got something more. And maybe along the lines, you're willing to, to pay yourself a little bit less because you want to make sure that you have a better chance of it being as beautiful as can be so that it will make money. But unless you truly don't need ever to make any money, I would pay yourself. Build your budget. You're providing a service to the film. The investors only are going to get their money back if it's a good film. If you working on it makes it more likely they're going to get their money back, you should get the budget. I have a question. Yes. Um, so if, um, well, when, I, if I if I have something if I have a screenplay that's copyrighted mm -hmm. and it's not a work for hire, right? It, it's it, and you did it first as a screenplay completely, right? And it, okay. it's mine. Yeah, so it's mine. So then when I go to sell it, how it, it, do I basically you know like let's say they say you know we're gonna pay this much for and I agree to that and so then. Do I do, am I do I just sign a paper off and they then may own it? Uh, there's nothing on on the copyright form itself. Yeah, no. And so, good question. Good question. So, and it, and it's kind of a function of time. So, if you if you write a screenplay, you, you, that's your screenwriter, and you write a screenplay, you've got it finished, and now you want to shot. Well, it's good. It, it's copywritten the moment you finish. You don't have to file anything to own the copy. Right. But not a bad idea to spend 50 bucks at the copyright office and when it's done and get a copyright registration. If you're a member of the Writers Guild, you may register with the Writers Guild. It's another thing. Those are just ways to tell the rest of the world, hey, this is mine, you can't steal. Yeah. But now when you want to go shop, if if someone decides they want to make a film based on that, they're likely to give you the paper, first of all. And it's likely to include uh, either assigning the copyright to them, you know, transferring ownership of the copyright, which has to be in writing, in return for uh, probably a fixed fee, and then maybe some percentage of profits, credit. Maybe they want to also engage your services as a writer for rewrites and other things come up during the film. But or maybe they're going to have their own writers and they just want to option your, they want to treat it like a, a book. And so they'll option it. You know, they may option it from and say, we, we're interested in it, we want to option it. We think it's worth, uh, I'm pulling numbers out here, hundred thousand dollars. So we'll pay a 10 now, and that gives us 18 months to have options being played. See if we can shop it, find a director, attach talent, do other things like that. If we get all these things, then we're gonna come back and we're gonna pay you section. That might be your negotiation. In that circumstance, though, 
what they're really buying is first of all, they're buying time to keep off the market. And if they decide to purchase it, they're buying the right so you can't do anything else with it again. Now, if you're Quentin Tarantino, um, like he did with Pulp Fiction, when he sold his script to Miramax, he retained in his deal publication rights and certain inter- others, a few other things that are interesting but were not relevant at the time. They got the right to the screenplays for all purposes, film, video, anything related to that. But he retained publication rights, meaning he could publish it as a book if he wanted to. They, he kept that right. That was negotiated. What he Because when you own a copyright, you own a, a bundle of sticks. Each one of them is a unique right. You can take one stick out and keep the other five or give somebody four and keep two kind of thing. So that was the deal then. And that, why that, the only reason I know this is because now it's relevant because Quentino wanted to make an NFT or sell a series of NFTs based on pages of his original handwritten screenplay, which he owned the publication right. And Miramax is suing to say, well, wait a second, that's this new digital art thing that's in our rights. And this is a very interesting legal fight now over how NFTs fit in the copyright law. But what, what was interesting to me was the original deal that he did at the time retained the publication rights. And sometimes that's the case. This, you know, the the movie company, I don't care. Write all the books you want after we've made the movie. But there might be a timing. But it's gonna be some kind of a transaction like that. Um, does it does it at all get sticky with group um, copyrights? Everything is stickier with group copyrights. Now, not always, but it can be. So if you have a group, if there's a group of writers. No, 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 no. Okay. Uh, uh, a group of you catalog. A, right, right. A, a group of unpublished works that are like now you can you can right now you can uh, copyright up to ten works in one copy. Oh yeah, no, no it's all, but each one still that's just a bulk file. That's okay. That's all. That, that's just saving you money to copyright. Yeah, but each work is still independently copyrighted. Yes. And you don't, and, and, and filing for a copyright registration is very important if you ever need to enforce it because somebody infringed your work. But it isn't what makes you a copyright owner. What makes you a copyright owner is type it up on keys and print it out on paper. Then you're a copyright owner. So these other steps are ways to make it harder for someone to steal it from you and easier for you to enforce if that happens. But you can still do the deal with filmmakers without a copyright registration. Understood. That's the key. Um, I have another question. Yeah. Well, a comment with regard to the budget. As an investor, the importance is they want to know how the money is going to be spent. Absolutely. Especially if you're going to pay yourself. So uh, that is so, that's probably the most, one of the most important thing we've seen so far is this item. Uh, if you don't do this right, it's never going to happen. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. And, I, and, I, and that's why I think you should, your budget should have a line item for editors, crew, locations, talent, pre production, post production, sound, color, everything that it's going to go, right? And it's how many hours and how many people or time or whatever your metric is going to be. If you are the people doing some of those things, the investors just need to trust, them, to decide that you. Are going to hire a competent crew, right? They're not going to have oversight that your camera had. They're going to assume that you're, I mean, hopefully, they're going to assume that you know who you're hiring. And so it's a good idea to say, and I'm going to be doing this role. This is going to be me. This is going to be Fred. This is going to be Sally or whomever. Now, if your company is also getting paid in the budget, one of the things that, I, and I think I mentioned, I don't know if it was one of these slides. Yeah, so in this structure, down at the bottom, you see production company fee. This is this is a structure where there's a physical production company that's going to manage the whole thing. And they're going to manage the budget, they're going to manage, they're going to hire everybody, they're going to do all of the legal, they're going to engage legal, they're going to engage insurance, all of this stuff. A lot of times you'll see a production company fee built into the budget, typically 10%. Now, this is a large enough budget to sort of have this 
mechanism. But it work, the concept is also one that's valuable, I think, for your situation when you're both the, the, the humans doing the work and the production company. There's, you're not just showing up at eight and leaving at five, right? You got a crew in, so or nine to four, or 10 to whatever, right? But you're not, because then you're working on the next day. You're coordinating, you're dealing with the person who didn't show up, all this other stuff. So that's the production company fee. And so I think it's also a good idea to build in 10% or some reasonable percent, not more than that, but something like that. It's the production company, it's the overall production company fee. Now, so, you know, Johnson Productions, 10% production company fee. That's on top of every other thing in the budget. That's an extra 10% for the production company. That's to keep the lights on. That's to make the whole thing happen. Now, Mary Johnson, who's part of Johnson company, is also this line item here is showing up every day and doing this work. That's okay. You need to disclose it all to your investors, but they should see that. I think more investors want to know that you're paying yourself properly. You're not skimming, but you're you're because you're going to show up every day and do the work, then, right? And then that 10% is where the overages are covered. So if the production company delivers everything on time and on budget, then there will be an extra 10% there and they can keep it. Great. Everybody's happy. But if you, if some things go over budget, things get delayed or whatever, and it's not the kind of thing, you know, sometimes if you go like halfway through, you're like, oh my God, we need a car crash. We didn't have a car crash in there before, but this thing would be, we can sell, we, Netflix will buy it if there's a car crash. You might go back to your investors and say, we need to revise the budget and, and add a car crash. And the investors say, okay, great, then that's fine. But sometimes you had a car crash and it wasn't part of the budget and you can't go back and ask for money. That's where that 10% covers that. So the production company gets rewarded for turning it in on time. But also is that's where if it if it doesn't hit it, then it comes out of that. And so the concept is one that's fairly well understood in the industry and properly explained is not inconsistent with doing it correct. It, it, it's not you sort of double dipping. It's just making sure that the you always want to, I think you always want to talk about, we're all working for the project. We work for the film. We don't work for the production company. We don't work for the investors. We work for the film. That's why we don't get paid hourly because that creates this weird disincentive to call or whatever. We work for the film too. If the film's successful, then we benefit, everybody benefits, but we're all working for the film. So, Telling your investors that you truly have thought about every dollar that's necessary to make this thing what it should be, I think is the strongest message you can give to potential investors. No, I was, I was going to say, we've seen recently from the investor side of it, of them coming trying to, not they're not trying to fudge the numbers, but they are paying themselves and they don't want it to come off the wrong way, but then it ends up coming across the wrong way if they didn't disclose, like, they are going to pay themselves. So I feel like we just fully disclose all those things and investors are a lot more open to Absolutely. putting their money. They just want to know where it's going. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because the investors will assume you're paying yourself anyway somehow. And if they can't see it, then they're going to wonder what else is not there. Sure. And uh, is it normal or usual to put in an auditing uh, Sure, it can be. Or I'll the money back so they can follow the investment as it goes forward in the production. Sure, I mean, there's a number of different ways. So that's a great question. And that's a concept of, and, and all, some of these things are good ideas that you're just not really workable in a $50,000 budget. Though. Right. But they're absolutely necessary to 500 or 5 million whatever and among those are are holdbacks in the budget um that you, you the production company may include in the budget the cost of a completion bond 
where they're actually buying an insurance policy that if they somehow fall short, the insurance company will come in and complete the film to protect the investors and the production company has to pay for that. And that's a cost that get, gets that comes out of the budget. You know, I mean, so depending on the size of the budget, you might add, and so among these things you might add is the right for the investors to audit the books. I, I think, and frankly, if you're, why wouldn't you include that, right? And one of the reasons that we recommend often setting up a freestanding legal entity for the purposes of owning the film, and if your investors are owners in that entity, that's the vehicle for the investment, then as owners of the company, they have a legal right to, to see the books. And as you as other owners of the company who are operating it by making the film, you have a fiduciary duty to them not to mislay the funds. It's not just a contractual obligation. It's a higher level legal obligation. And everybody can see the books. And so again, if you are if you put together a realistic and true budget at the start, you're never going to have to worry about showing anybody because you've shown them everything up front. And then all you got to do is make sure that that's where you spend it. Yes? How do you, uh, is there a source you can refer to to find out what the uh, fair market price is for all these different entities? For like which, to, like for? Uh, uh, the crew, the different <laughs> elements. Oh, of, oh all this, yeah, uh, yeah, there are. Yeah, there are some different sources. Um, a lot of it depends kind of on, um, I mean, we, we worked on, on films of all sizes and, and productions of different sizes. I'm sure there are, I don't have off the top of my head, but that's a great question. We'll look into that to see if there are, because that would be a good source. I mean, you could check with, um, and you may, there may be even sources here in this room or in the filmmaking community that sort of say, hey, here's, Here's a typical, you know, day rate for cameraman. Here's a day rate for this and that sort of thing. Um, I was going to say unions too, like if you contact unions yeah. to talk about it. If, yeah, I mean, if you were having a union, so. yeah, and that's that's a, and that's a good good point. Union, non-union. I mean, a lot of small projects are done on a non-union basis, and you're not hiring any crew, you're not hiring any actors, and that's okay. You're not required to. But your contract should say this is a non-union project. And everybody, and, but if you end up hiring somebody that's union, they may not be permitted by being members of the union to also do non-union work with the same thing. And so sometimes you might have to, well, we really want this person, but they're SAG actor. So we're going to have to make sure that we pay them at least this much. If our budget is small, SAG has a smaller scale. If you're in the micro budget, you can pay them a lower rate. But you still have to put some money in there. It also goes into the pension and those other things. And it's just part of doing that. But it, it is, it's a great point. If you just want to educate yourself on sort of going rates for these different aspects, starting with the with the unions, uh, is a great place to do it. They'll, you know, you'll find out what the union rates are, and then you may gradually find out what other rates might be for non-union people. And there are plenty of people in the production world that are not union. A lot of the a lot of the production clients that we work with that, that also make commercials and do digital videos and things like that, they operate as non-signatories. That means the company's not signed a collective bargaining agreement. And therefore, the company is not required to always be the talent. But then the company is also very clear when it's hiring. This is non-union. And when we do that, they often sometimes will say, but we're shooting in California and we have to use union people, so we pay union rents. It's not an anti, it's not a pro or anti-union approach. It's just for certain businesses, certain sizes, the budgets won't allow them to use union crews, union labor. I mean, they can't, that makes it too expensive to do this. The, 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 whoever they are, their customer will hire somebody else. Uh, but it is a great place to start to get a sense of those things. Those, those I was going to throw out too, sometimes people, if they're not union, like at least St. Louis crews that I've experienced, like sometimes if your project sounds cool, they'll take a lower rate than they might normally because they want to be a part of the project. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's some level of negotiation with people are you know? Yeah. So sometimes it's like pitching your project in a cool way, which you did a little bit ago. Yeah. So yeah, yeah right. I think maybe people will be down, you know, they're well, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> 
How about for legal? Is there, can you give us an indication what to expect for deals with uh, our legal counselors? I mean, is it or is sure. it a big specialist or well, pay by the hour? Well, so I think, you know, when, when there is a budget, which is, there's got to be money for there to be a budget, right? When there's a budget and there's money, the work that we do from that point forward, we do it as a percentage. We our and, and entertainment lawyers in general typically do it this way. You work as a percentage of the budget. So, but there's work, there's legal work that has to happen before there's a budget. There's rights acquisition, things like that. So sometimes we do that on an hourly basis. With clients that do it regularly, we typically set up different types of arrangements. Sometimes we work on a retainer or a fixed fee basis because what we what we really don't want our creative clients to do is self-edit when they think they should call a lawyer. I mean, think to yourself, have you ever had the thought, I want to rush call a lawyer? Okay, if you've had that thought in your head, you know the answer is yes. Yeah. <laughs> your brain's already told you the answer is yes. But if your immediate next thought is, but I'm not going to, because I don't want to start the meter running, that's entirely rational on your part. That's a default in our business plan when we bill hourly. Now, sometimes legal work has to be done, but in the creative space, it doesn't, typically. And we don't want you not to call when you should call. So whenever we can, we try to set up different types of branch. We have to make sure we can, you know, that the firm will let us keep our chairs here. So we, you know, we have to get comped. But when we do this work, and the other, the other element, I'll be very honest with you, is we can do this work really well because and Kara's new, but she's very good. And she's already done a ton in a couple of years. I've been doing this for a long time. If I'm only selling you two hours of my time, I am absolutely stealing from myself. Because you're not getting the benefit of two hours. You're getting the benefit of 20 years. The reason I can do something in two hours is because I've been doing it for 20 years and I can do it in two hours. Somebody else would take 20 hours to maybe get a hat right. So I don't want to oversell myself, but I don't want to undersell. But if, if you and I agree that I'm adding value to the film, because that's what I'm working for, and I fit in a percentage of the budget that's fully disclosed, and we have agreed ahead of time that that's fair, I might say, yeah, that budget's why I'm not getting paid my hourly rate for this one. But I've made the decision already. It's fine. I love the work. Because another project, may have a budget that's 10 times as big, it's not going to require me to do 10 times as much work. And so on that one, I'm going to get paid a lot more than my hour for the exact same amount of work because it's just as hard. We will work just as hard on a little budget film as we will on a big budget film because this contract is the same. Every aspect of the film is the same. Literally every aspect in its own as a thing. Of scale and scope and all those things are different. But the same paper, same set of negotiations, right? Roughly. So um, that's why we work when we can on a percentage basis like that, because then we're just lined up along. Um, if you do a lot of work where there's not a budget, then we have to figure out other ways to make it work. But we try to do that. Do you include any uh, post-production uh, enforcement or monitoring or that sort of I mean, it can be. That can be a, something that we do. Sure. Um, you know, if we, I mean, we, we talk about that on a, we, we deal with each of these things as a, as a unique engagement. So I think we've been running along. This has been a great conversation with everybody. I don't want to cut anybody short. I did want to tell you, this is, I mentioned this before. So this is a good friend. I'm not going to say his name. He's a very successful filmmaker. Um, he's my neighbor as well. Um, but we, st we started working. He had a situation. He made his first film a number of years ago. Small budget film. Made it with friends. Short period of time. Didn't get location agreements. Didn't have a lot of written agreements. You know, any of that stuff. And it made some, got seen in some places. He was doing later work. Got noticed. Somebody looked at the original one, fell in love with it. He got an international distribution film. 
for this international distribution deal for this small film. So excited about it. But the exhibit, so he gets about a five page contract. But exhibit A was like nine bullet points of things he was going to have to deliver. And half of them were the not, you know, digital in this format and blah, 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 and this for translation, things that he could do because they were technical. But the last bullets were copies of all of your rights acquisition agreements, copies of all your location agreements, copies of all your clearance for all things he didn't do. He couldn't distribute the film. Now, thankfully, we were able, it was a small enough project, he was able to put the toothpaste back in the tube. He could go back to each of the people, and they were willing to sign an agreement. So I made, we, I gave, got them all the forms, got them all the structure. He was able to go back and assemble it so he could do that in the film. He didn't see it. But that was luck. That it was a small enough project. He knew the people. He knew where they were. And we could get it done. But we all neighbors at the time. What's that? Were you neighbors at the time? Well, I was I was like, um, let's see, here's where you we got getting to you. Well, <laughs> we we were able to, you know, we had worked together on some other stuff. This was the first time like this. And when I was talking to him, I said, Yeah, you, here's what we're gonna have to do. We can try to do it this way. And we were and we were able to. But you are saying it is luck or fortunately. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Because all of these other people think you're making 10 million on this stuff. Well, exactly. You go back to somebody a couple of years later and say, hey, did <laughs> you sign this thing that your dad you signed before? <laughs> Worth their dad. Your dad got a lot of study. Might be out of luck if they don't have the right. That's the point. I mean, these are, that's why you do these things before you are starting with them. And that's why you have these lists that you go through as you go through the process. So uh, let's say you had to go back and get all mm -hmm. the signages. Do the people who sign these releases are they able to recoup any residuals? Because that's something that might. It, it might depends be. on what the contract says. Depends on what you're what you're offering them. I mean, not automatically. Every single the concept of residuals, the concept of future royalties, the concept those are all legitimate things that happen. But they all happen because there was a written contract that said they were happy. They're not automatic. So now somebody might expect them. Somebody might negotiate for them. You might agree to give somebody that. It's a, it's a the concept of profit. So in the production side, but you know, remember you you got one side's the producers, one side's the money. Fifty percent of the ownership. 50, 50% of the profit participation, 50% of the whatever is going to the cash, going to the investors after they get paid back and they get a premium. Then all of the profit at that point is they get 50% and then 50% comes to the swag of the producers. If you decide that you need to give talent, key talent, a couple of points, and you need to give somebody else a couple of this. And somebody else has agreed to work for less if they get a participation. All, you can do that. All of that's going to come out of your, the 50% that is on the producer side. can be divided up however the producers decide. Be coming out of that production. Or out of those profits. But remember, those profits don't exist until after the investors have been paid back. And typically, then some. So the film's got to make enough money, first of all, to pay off all of its if the film's operated properly and doesn't have deferred much in the way of deferments, then all of the expenses essentially have been paid by the time it's going to go out to the world because all of the expenses were captured in the budget. So the first dollars that come in from a festival or any kind of distribution start paying the investors back. And then once the investors have been made whole, and typically there's a 10 or 20 percent premium that they get. Then that's when the producers start to make money. That's why you should pay yourself for the services that you're doing before that, because that may be a couple of years before that, if it happens. But in the meantime, when you're offering somebody points or participation, it's you taking, I get 50% of the profits after this thing happens, someday hopefully. I'll give you 
It's five percent of what I make. That's two and a half points. I'll give you three or whatever, right? You can do that with your side, but that's got to be in a written agreement. So you may have key talent that says, "I will do this. I will get paid this plus two points on the back end," and it'll it'll be two and a half pages of paragraphs to say two points on the back end. But the point is, you know, that might be something that they negotiate for. That's a concept of residuals in a way. If it's it's not so much residuals in the way like. A residual, typical way you think of residuals is if you, you're uh, an actor and you appear in a commercial for, you know, Coca-Cola, let's say, I'm using that. And it's going to run for, you're going to pay so much and it's going to run for six month period. And you can pay this much. But your contract may say, Coca-Cola decides, we're going to run that commercial again next year. If they run it again, then you'll get residuals. You get paid some additional because they ran it. And that's more the concept of residuals. They are dependent on future uses. In the film space, you're more likely to simply say, we're going to just kind of put this out of the world and we may distribute here, there, there, people here, wherever it goes, as broad as we can make it, all dollars that come in are going to be treated in this way. And so the profit participation might go, you know, but again, you got to pay your, uh, Pay your investors back first. I will give you one more example of. of now, I, this was a little tiny filmmaking, right? This was gigantic filmmaking. Still made a mistake. So, I don't know if you guys remember The Hangover Part Two. Obviously, everybody knows Mike Tyson. Yeah, I don't know if you know him personally, but you know, we know who he is and that famous tattoo. Well, Victor Whitman was a client. Um, I, 2011, I was in a small three-person law firm here in town. We represented Victor. Victor was the tattoo artist who put that tattoo in Mike Tyson's face when he was in Las Vegas eight years earlier. By 2011, Victor had moved to Southern Missouri, a small town, um, about an hour south of here. Nice, quiet life, full tattoo parlor on the main. Just loved being, you know, who he was. One day. He goes into a 7-Eleven in March of that year, and there's a gigantic big gulp cup with Ed Helm's face on it with that tattoo. And he's like, wait a second. That's my tattoo. So he didn't know. He's like, so they should have, shouldn't they have asked me? I feel like he went to a local lawyer in town who was like at the diner, asked him about something about, do you know what I mean? And that guy had gone to Washington Law School and taken a class from my partner who taught him about copyright law. He said, I think you should call these guys. So he did. He called them. Two months later, we were in federal court three days before Memorial Day weekend trying to get the movie stopped for copyright infringement. All kinds of coverage. And look it up. We, the judge allowed the case to go forward. Even though she ruled in our favor, it was copyright infringement. Um, she allowed the movie to go forward. We were, we were taking the position to you need an injunction, you don't have the right to display the movie. Knowing that if the judge ruled in our favor, we would still settle that night and the movie would still open, then we just, our client would get another digit or two perhaps. Um, but the reality was there were 4,000 theaters around the country that were counting on this film to open the next day as their temple, pay for their entire year almost. This movie made the highest grossing company of all time. We knew it was going to be a massive. So she ruled in our favor, but she did let the film go where we settled about a month and a half. The point is, Warner Brothers at the time had over 6,000 copyrights. They're highly sophisticated intellectual property copyright filmmakers, and they screwed this up because there's an extra set of rights inside that. They had Mike Tyson's permission. He was in the film. He was in the first one and the second one. Mike Tyson had an implied license from Victor. Mike can walk around the world with that on his face, be photographed, filmed a thousand times. Nobody has to ask Victor's permission. But they made a copy of the art and put it somewhere else. That was the infringement. And that was where they made the mistake. And so a lot of times we see the reverse happen. You think you have the copyright. You have the right from the copyright owner, but there's a human being inside that copyrighted image. You need their permission to, to use that image or that footage. So 
this is my point out here. One, you can screw it by not getting your contracts and rights in the first place. The other, you can screw it by not realizing that just any one set of image may have layers of rights inside of it that are owned by different rights holders. And so that early rights acquisition phase, that's when you spot this stuff. And you think through, okay, I'd like to do, I'd like to incorporate this into here. What rights are involved? What do I need if I want to do this? Your question about the combination of old footage, new music, you've got layers, you've got humans, you've got copyrighted music, you've got new copyrighted footage, you've got multiple layers, and this is just the kind of thing to think through. With these seconds of footage, what do I need to make sure these seconds of footage are okay? And so I, I use this example, one of those really fun things to do, but also it just points out making these mistakes isn't something that only beginners do. So make all the mistakes you can. Make your mistakes by, oh, I wish I would have made a better shot of it. Oh, I wish I would have edited that. But hopefully don't make the mistakes of, boy, if I only had this content. One of the things that got me into the work I do now, because I started in this area by litigating these cases. And I began to realize that the one thing all these cases had in common was the lack of a piece of paper before that was money. One or two paragraphs before there was any money, they would have looked at it and said, absolutely right, I agree. We all signed it. No lawsuit. But because there wasn't a piece of paper, and if your film never makes any money, nobody's going to sue you. But that's not what you're planning for. You're planning for success. All right, first of all, thank you for your sharing your 20 years of experience here. You're welcome. Very informative um, but to show you my notes, I would look at this now. I think it's the trademark as it's an image and it has to be a registered trademark. And, and, I, and one of the things I appreciate you just mentioned that the copyright is um, starts as soon as you complete the work and you don't have to have the registration. But I thought of things like trademark, I would have to go Well, trademark, trademarks are interesting. Trademarks are, are source identifiers and they don't need to be registered either in order to get common law rights. But if you don't register your trademark federally, the only rights you get are within the geographic reach of where you operate your business and people have gradually come to know you under that name. So a business can operate, you know, brick and mortar business can operate in St. Louis for years and never file anything, but really be the only one that could ever operate that type of business in St. Louis because everybody knows that, that be, that's become their trademark. The reason you file for a federal trademark registration is if you have any hope of going beyond just the location, or you're operating on the internet now or anything else, and you want to claim sort of presumptive nationwide rights. So somebody else can't come into town and create confusion, things like that. But technically, you do not need to file a registration to be a trademark. But your rights are limited. Copyright, your rights are 100% of the rights that you have as a copyright owner, the instant you create something. The registration doesn't give you any more rights. The only thing the registration gives you, though, which can be very important, is it's your ticket into court. You cannot sue somebody for copyright infringement without registration. You will not be allowed to file a lawsuit. So if you're doing works for hire for people regularly and that's not going to be your thing, who cares? You don't have to file a bunch of registrations. Because the point is, your work is not going to be infringed. Your work is being included in somebody else's work and somebody else file registration. But if you're creating work and you're putting it out in the world where it's accessible and someone can take it, you know, photographer, great example. Photographers who do who regularly get hired to do professional shoots and weddings and things like that. Maybe they're always intending their clients to own the copyright and footage. They're just getting paid for their services. But they also do some art and they do some other things and they have a website and they put the images up there and people can write click, copy, and paste. And all of a sudden you see their images showing up in somebody else's advertising. That person needs to file a registration whenever before they post so that then when that happens, they've got the registration in hand, they can send the cease and desist letter, and it can act right away. So you need a copyright registration to enforce your rights. You don't need it to sell your rights, license them, anything else. It's only in, a trans only in an enforcement litigation situation that you need a registration. It's important, and I, we recommend creators get used to the habit because it's not hard to do. It's not expensive, but um, it's not actually necessary. Yeah. Yeah. So that's my question. Like if, if I wrote something 
and um, it was stolen from me. That actual piece of paper or you know notebook was stolen, and then it turns out on something that's published nationwide or whatever. How do you? Well, you can go back and find. So let's say you created something ten years ago, and you discover just now it's been stolen. Uh -huh. You can file a registration right now. It's accurate this ten years ago, mm -hmm. and you can get the registration. I have to wait eight or nine months to get the registration issue and everything else. But at that point. And then you can sue, or you can and you can have them take it down or return it again. So you can prove everything. You can sue. Well, how? But if it's stolen from me, like the well, if you don't have, if they took the, if, if the only copy you had was in a physical notebook and they took the notebook, yeah, you're gonna have to prove that underlying thing first. That that really was your creation and really was done, and they really took it. Yeah. How? I don't know. That's a that's a mystery. I'm not sure the evidence there. That would be. A, I mean, the evidence might be there. The person might. I mean, it I, I guess. Whatever. I mean, I could prove that I can create work of a similar similar. But that's not. But people do that all the time. Now, if you type something, if you've got it saved in a file, and you still have the original in your file, you can prove that you created it this time, and then you see it because somebody got on your computer or somebody. Came in your house or store your laptop or whatever, but it's it's accessible in the cloud. Or something. That's a different story. But if literally the thing only exists and there's only one copy, and somebody takes that copy, now you're in a, a different type of theft. If if they then make copies of that and do other things with it, that may also be infringement. But you're going to have a difficult time proving that that was used in the first place. That is also why there's value in when you you know when you've created something and you, it's substantially complete. Go ahead and file a copyright registration. It costs 50 bucks. Well, not 60. You know, or 60. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, that's fine. Yeah. 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 But you're right. I mean, it's still, right? It's still, that's a small price to pay. And you can do it in bulk too if you have several. But the point is, you're creating, because then you're uploading to the copyright office a copy of it as well. So you created this proof environment. So then if that thing shows up somewhere else, you're like, that was mine. And then in order to prove infringement, you have to prove they had access to it. So it's one thing if you type it right, but no one has seen it. You may own the copyright, you may file a registration. But if a movie shows up and it's exactly like yours, somebody else could have had a similar idea. Unless you can prove that they had access to yours somehow, you're not going to be able to prove infringement. We so, talked about this the other day at lunch with the movie Beautiful Boy with Sash Rafina. Right. Playing music at the end of the movie, and his son calls him after the movie and says, Dad, you're right. in this movie. Well, and so that's an example where we, and we need to look at that more closely. If that's really his, if that's the sound recording from their album, yeah. then that, depending on the nature of the underlying publishing agreement or whatever he signed when he created the music, someone else may have had the right to grant that license to the filmmakers. Because I'm sure that movie did not get it under. Prayers without somebody saying we have a synchronization license for this music. And sync license requires a license from the sound recording, the record label typically, and the songwriters. But the songwriters may have given those over to the published company, may have given something else, and they may have given up. Now, if they've done all that, there should be some trickle that eventually gets to the songwriters. Yes, you don't recall getting that. Yeah, well, somebody somewhere, somebody, somebody, somebody somewhere, somewhere at least thinks they have a piece of paper, but if they don't, and listen, Warner Brothers thought they had everything locked up for the highest growth, grossing movie of the year, and they did. So there might be something worth looking at. So we've we've done our Q and A throughout the whole thing. So which which to me makes a much better presentation. I hope you all got something out of it. We are very happy. Why did you start with VLA 8? Because I've been looking for someone like you all. Well, we do, um, I don't know, when we, how long we've often Yeah, I mean, over the I years. Because I said I needed an entertainment attorney, I mean, several years ago. And well, not, I, not for a number one. of years, for a number of years, I was in-house with um, a production company, Cool Fire Studios, coming here in town, who does television, documentary film, digital, and I was their in-house counsel for about five years. So I wasn't doing Outside client work for a number of years, but I'm back. Last four years, I've been back doing it. So, 
Um, yeah, so you can find us if you if you go to the, if you look for if you forget anything else, just go to the screenlawyer.com. That'll take you to our page on my page on our website. Care the whole website there cares there as well. Um, our contact information is there. We're happy to talk. Um, we love VLAA, so Sue's here. Uh, oh, you're here. Sue. Wow! Yes, if you, if you need a wonderful organization yeah. um, and uh, and a great support of the arts, one of the things and, yes. and, and thanks to Cinema St. Louis. I mean, we are so a lot of times I think in St. Louis we have this, you know, we're kind of like oh, we feel like we we criticize ourselves too much sometimes. As if we think, oh, we're not, you know, New York, or LA, whatever, or we get defensive when somebody, we have this attitude, right? Whatever you want to call it. But what is true is that this town has a great film community, a very robust community, a lot of people who put a lot of time and effort in all sorts of different ways. Cinema St. Louis is, is a great, and BLA as well, great sort of resources, gatekeepers, if you will, or connecting points, maybe not gatekeepers, but they don't keep people out. But connecting points, um, Missouri Film Office, others, they what I have found is that they're tremendously supportive. People will help each other because any success in this town helps every other future success possibly make it a little bit more likely that it'll happen because it gets numb. So if you haven't met people, I encourage you to meet people that are here, come to their closing night party if you can on a Sunday. Um, do some of the screenings, look for the film festival in the fall, um, check out Cinema St. Louis, There's, you know, follow them on, on social. Um, it, there, there are great resources in this town, and I learn from them all the time, and, uh, and, and happy to be a resource along with everybody else if you need.